I'm Ken Blackwell, Senior Fellow for Family Empowerment here at the Family Research Council. Uh, I will be the facilitator of today's discussion. Um, the theme for the discussion today will be marriage and civil rights, how to respond rightly if the court gets it wrong. So we are working under the dreadful assumption that the court might get it wrong, and if they get it wrong, the question is how do we uh, as engaged citizens and particularly engaged Christians respond to that wooden-headed decision. <clears throat> Joining our discussion today are two veterans from the civil rights movement, Dr. Alfita King and Deacon Keith Fortier, both who in fact have put a lot of shoe leather, uh, who in fact have invested a lot of themselves uh, in uh, American exceptionalism uh, and in the constant struggle uh, to make sure that we as a beloved community uh, get it right in terms of civil and human rights. What we're going to do is take a f each of us take a few minutes to discuss how we see the present situation uh, and how and what informs our discussion today about how we respond uh, in, a, in, a right, in the right way to a wrong decision. Let me just start off by saying that in 239 years, you know, let me, let me stop myself. If you will bow for a moment of prayer with me. <clears throat> Father, we come to you in the knowledge that the full measure of our faithfulness is not where we stand in times of comfort, but where we stand in times of great challenge. In these times of trials and tribulation, we stand fast in your word. You are our light and our salvation. You protect us from danger. Father, we know no fear, for we are confident that you will save and sustain us. Thank you for bringing to our remembrance that where your will takes us, your grace will sustain us. You are our rock. And in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, 239 years for that period of time, we have emerged through trials and tribulations as the world's most profound human democracy. We haven't always gotten it right. We are not perfect, but as Abraham Lincoln said, we are perfectible, particularly when we operate in a way that is consistent with God's word. Over that 239 years, we have seen hurdles and we have faced challenges. There have been pivotal moments and events the Civil War, our response in World War II, the great civil rights movement, how we responded to 9-11. And I would tend to put a wrong decision in this marriage case as being another one of those challenging moments, defining moments as to a test of how we respond as a nation, but how we also respond as believers, as Christians. 
There is a passage in Psalms, Psalms 11 to be specific, that says, when the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? That is a question. Here at the Family Research Council, we say we suit up, as we're told to do in Ephesians 6.10, in the full armor of God. And I think we should go to the lessons taught by that field general, Nehemiah, who in fact, when he went into saw, to the center of the city of Jerusalem and he saw that the walls were crumbling and, and in disarray, he let out a clarion call. He said, come, let us build together. And just as we have the negative nabobs of our culture, uh, he had Getchum and Sam Ballot and Tobias, all full of doubt, saying, you can't do this. You know, uh, the, the, the forces stronger than you have spoken. Uh, this foundation uh, cannot be fortified or repaired. But he had a very specific strategy a strategy that I saw played out in the 60s uh, and the 70s. His strategy was to rebuild that wall as a community of builders. Uh, and he said that each person, each family would take a section of that wall and be responsible for that section. Uh, and what I saw in uh, the great civil rights movement as a youngster, but as one who was engaged, um, I saw people doing what they could do to um, overcome the challenge of our time in the 60s, in the 50s, and in the 70s. This was brought to, to bear on me uh, Several years ago, when I went down to uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Center, and they were going through an exercise, they had out in front of the center books with blank pages. And the question that was asked is that during the Civil Rights Movement, what did you do? And people coming in to the center could write. And so somebody said, I cooked chicken. I led a prayer circle. I drove a carpool. I stood guard at night. And so what Nehemiah's plan helped me to understand in that time was that we all have something that we can do. And I think that the, it first begins with what we are told in Scripture and various books of Scripture. <coughs> Pope John Paul II used to more frequently refer to this part of the Scripture in Luke when he used to say, be unafraid. We cannot be afraid as we approach uh, the possibility that we might, we might have to deal with a wrong-headed decision. And I want to read something to you from Alvita's uncle. This is something that he penned that is always good to reflect on. He said, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscious asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular but one must take it 
because it is right. Ladies and gentlemen, what we want to do in this conversation today is to ready ourselves by looking at those questions or that statement by Dr. King, understanding what scripture tells us, how we must prepare ourselves in the full armor of God to do this battle for what is right. It might not be politically correct in today's culture, but I will just end my remarks by saying that I visited a college where I was giving uh, a lecture one year, and on a wall there was a quote from Nietzsche. It was, God is dead, Nietzsche. I was there maybe eight months later before folks were politically correct. That was still up, but it had a line through it, and it said, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I just, you know, we, we have to prepare. We have to prepare for this wrong-headed decision, but it's not as if we don't have a game plan, as Nehemiah laid out for us, and it's not because we haven't been told how to suit up. Wow. <laughs> How in the world, Ruth, could I get that? How could I follow that? As he was sharing uh, one of the quotes from my uncle, uh, I've got a book, King Rules, and I quote it in the back. There are some tweets, 140 characters or less. And uh, one of the tweets was his prayer, thanking God for marriage. And I, I hope I can find that real quick as I share that. And uh, wrong decision, it would definitely be wrong if they led us down uh, this path. And uh, it, would, it would be very sad. And, but there's a scripture, Ken, that says, and Deacon, be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we cannot stop doing good work. And we have a responsibility to tell others for instance, one of the biggest arguments that uh, the Supreme Court will be hearing is, well, you people are sinners, so how can you tell us what to do or what not to do? Well, we already know two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> if anybody is sinning, it doesn't matter who it is, we need to stop, repent, turn away from it. And any of our human actions that don't line up with the word of God, and that is sin, we must repent. And so the answer is they would say, well, how could you tell me not to get married in a gay marriage ceremony when we know that you did this, that, or the other? Well, just because, for instance, and I'm not going to take it over on this page, but you know me from this language, too. I had two abortions and a miscarriage. So people say, well, how can you tell me not to have one if you had one? Well, they hurt me, hurt the baby. I can tell you that. So with the gay marriage situation, and this is very true, I rarely talk about this publicly, but this is the arena. My three oldest children had a godfather who was openly gay. He did not think he was married to another man because in those days that confusion did not exist. <laughs> this is confusion, it's confusion. Uh, Charisma Magazine posted recently with uh, Bruce Jenner that he's confused. And he said, I feel so empty. Well, Ken has really defined by scripture what it takes to fill you up when you're empty. And it's not surgery. It's not a new hairdo. It's not, I feel like I can't, I need to be this or that. It hits more closely to home with me. Three of my oldest children had a godfather who was openly gay. This was before I was born again. Nice man, great generous, precious. I didn't understand the Bible in those days, so he says, I want to be a godfather to some of your children. I said, okay. As soon as I was born again in 1983, I said, but your lifestyle's not going to work for you in eternity. We sat down and had a long talk about it. And before he left the earth, 
he began to consider those issues. We have an obligation to speak out, not from a judgmental, not that we are such perfect Christians, so you need to follow our example. No. We have issues too. You need to follow our creator, God, our Lord Jesus, our comforter, Holy Spirit. And these are the things that we have to say in Galatians 4.16. Have we become your enemies, justices? Because we are telling you the truth. Truth, crushed to earth, will rise again, but we must stand in truth. We can't be intimidated. Well, you Christians, you're fake. You're hypocrites. You're phony. You're sinning, and you're telling us what to do. No. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, we have too. But a merciful God heard our cries when we turned away from those errors. And you can do this too. We fail to teach the good news so much. My uncle, these are his words, and these are exact words, 140 characters. <laughs> have to keep saying that. My daughter bought me my first iPhone, gentlemen. <laughs> and she said, if you don't learn how to text, you'll never talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> So I have learned to speak in 140 <laughs> characters or less. Martin Luther King Jr. praying, creator of life, thank you for holy matrimony, the privilege you grant man and wife as parents to aid you in your creative activities. That's Martin Luther King Jr. praying. Mm -hmm. It's published in a book, Thou Dear God. And so I had that conversation with the godfather of my children. I believe he did hear me. He passed away after that. I believe he tried to live a celibate life until that time with that understanding. Then closer, and I'm not going to say which part of my family, but there's someone in our bloodline today who has a child, a man who has a child with a lesbian who's living openly with a lady. They think they are married. And I was talking to them, and my daughters were easing around to see what I was saying to them. <laughs> they said, Ma, you just don't have any sense. So I said to the young lady, I said, what kind of ring is that on your finger? Is it, is it, do you think it's an engagement ring? No, it's a wedding ring. I said, so you think it's a wedding ring? I said, actually, you really can't be married. I said, you didn't even do that in Georgia yet because it hasn't been resolved in Georgia. Where did it happen? In Florida. So the other day she called, I'm stressed out. I need to get a divorce. I said, you think you need to get a divorce because you think you're married. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just talking. But I know she's hearing me. She asked me why her partner had not cursed me out or tried to cut me with a knife because she doesn't allow people to ask her these kind of questions and have these conversations. I said, she knows 1 Corinthians 13 is true. Love never fails. So if they make this cockamamie decision, and it will be cockamamie, <laughs> our work will be harder, it will not be impossible. With God, all things are possible. Amen. But we've got to get over the aversion, the, oh, you're going to hell. Well, everybody's going to hell if we don't repent. Everybody. So there's no special category for this issue. And we are not going to allow it to any longer be a special category. It's sin. There is a solution. And the Lord has it. There you go. It's wonderful to be with you. And I think one of the silver linings in this dark cloud, and it is a dark cloud, let's face it, is that we're coming together. Think about it. Evangelicals, Protestants out of mainstream traditions, Catholics and Orthodox and, and faithful Jews and other people of goodwill are coming together to stand up again for what cannot be changed, and that is the nature of marriage. Uh, one of the things I, I do is write for the stream.org, stream.org as a senior writer. And after the Irish referendum, I was asked as a Catholic deacon, uh, how could Ireland do this? I thought Ireland was Catholic. And my response, well, obviously Ireland is not really Catholic. And I also said this, and, and this is what I'll say about the Obergefell-Hodges decision. After the referendum in Ireland, 
marriage had not changed. Ireland changed, but marriage had not changed. Marriage is between one man, one woman, intended for life, open to life, and formative of family. That is God's plan. It's revealed in the natural moral law, and it is true, and it cannot be changed. No referendum, no legislature, no executive, or no nine justices in a black robe can change the nature of reality. So what has happened is the ground has shifted, and we are Christians together now. In what, for all intents and purposes, is a pre-Christian age. You see, I decided years ago, it's time we stop talking about post-Christian, post-modern. We'd all be better off if we acted as though we awakened this morning in this nation that we love, and in the West, looked around, assessed the culture, and then got to work, Christianizing it, bringing the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ and the promise he brings of happiness and human flourishing. You see, we must oppose this unjust decision, not simply to protect ourselves, which we need to do, and the religious liberty implications are phenomenal here, but because God still loves the world so much, he still sends his only son, and he does that through the body of Christ, the church of which we are members. And because he loves all men and women, he wants them to find his loving plan. And from the beginning in the first chapter of the book of Genesis to the very end, that loving plan is revealed through marriage. Even the language of the New Testament, Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. One of the great things about Dr. King, Dr. King took his heroic stand because he was a Christian and he stood against injustice. You see, we were joking up here before it all began. Uh, I'm just still an old hippie trying to get to heaven. I mean, <laughs> look, one of these days I, I woke up and somebody started calling me a conservative. When I was a young man, I was rejecting the materialism of the age as a teenager and looking for another way to live. And I found that way in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So I've never identified with the labels anyway. Somebody sent me an article the other day uh, in the Atlantic, should conservatives engage in civil disobedience? Well, look, I don't know if I'm a conservative. I'm certainly not a liberal, and I'm certainly not what is masquerading as progressive these days. I do know what I am. I'm a Christian, a classical Christian called in this new missionary age to respond to this disastrous decision. The court cannot change the nature of truth. What has happened is the ground has shifted and now we are coming together. And I'll conclude my, my comments with a reminder because I'm also a lawyer, 35 years, and I've done constitutional law much of that time. This is not the first time we're facing a wrong decision. We faced it in Dred Scott in 1857 when the court said that persons of African descent cannot be nor ever were intended to be citizens under the U.S. Constitution. Horrendous decision. They were wrong. And what did we do? We did not accept that decision. We stood against it and we did what we needed to do until it was changed. Buck versus Bell, 1927 compulsory sterilization of the quote, unfit, including those who are intellectually disabled. What did we do? We stood against it and we rejected it. Fast forward 1973, the decisions of Doe and Roe together took away the fundamental human right of our first neighbors and the first home of the whole human race. The court had no right to take that human right away and to manufacture out of whole cloth some alleged right to take innocent human life. What did we do? We stood against it and persevered, and we continue to persevere. This is what we must do now with marriage and the family founded upon it, not just to protect ourselves, we need to protect the church, but because we love all men and women and we want them to find God's loving plan Marriages between one man and one woman, intended for life, open to life, and formative of family.
Thank you, Deacon. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to just have a little conversation for about 10 minutes between the three of us. You're sort of in the living room with us. Uh, and then we're going to open it up and engage, engage you all. And we can go to about a quarter after a quarter after one. And if it's really rocking and rolling, we that's what that's what keeps the hippie. Uh, if it's really rock, if it's really rocking and rolling, we we will uh, continue to one thirty. <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> um, you know, when I was when I was growing up, uh, and when my family sent me off to, to to college, and my colleagues here at FRC have heard me say this uh, a, a number of times. Um, uh, my grandmother, who was probably the first uh, psychiatrist uh, and philosopher that I ever came in contact with, even though she didn't graduate from high school. She sent me off to Xavier and she said, you know, <clears throat> you're going to a university with uh, a, a wonderful library because I know, I know because Ida Mae Gray, a good friend of mine, uh, cleans that library and it has thousands of books. She said, but I hope that we've trained you and educated you and familiarized you with three other books that are important that will help you face any challenges in, in life. And she said this in reverse order of importance. Your date book, your checkbook, and the good book. She said, your, your, your date book will tell how you spend your time and with whom you spend it. Your checkbook will tell how you marshal and use your resources, no matter how abundant or how meager. And she said, the Bible, the good book, will help you choose the path of conviction over the path of convenience. And the reason I started out uh, by talking about what Dr. King said about the nature of modern culture, he was talking about it in his time, but it still uh, is relevant in our time, uh, even more intensified, is that the culture of the West today, as, as it was said in his remarks, is it safe, is it politic, is it popular? The last question, that is asked by so many of our institutions today, is it, is, is it right? You know, uh, and what they don't seem to understand is what the founders of our nation understood as expressed in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. My dad said that was a very sophisticated way of saying any knucklehead should be able to get this. <laughs> that all of us are created equal in our humanity, that we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And that was the important phrase, that our human rights, our rights of conscience, are not grants from any government. They're gifts from God. No government, no court can take away what they didn't give you. They can only recognize your human rights. And among those are religious liberty and the rights of conscience. The question is, how do we respond when those rights are threatened? First, we know from experience that we do it nonviolently. We know from experience that we do it prayerfully. We know that there are overlapping, intersecting arena in which public policy and culture are shaped and influenced. The courts the beloved community where we speak in dialogue to one another, heart to heart, soul to soul, in legislative bodies across this country, 
And what we've known from the great civil rights movement, what we've known from our pushback against the wrong-headed court decision in 1973 is that we take direct action of resistance. But we do it in a responsible way, in a prayerful way. And let me just tell you that the reason I framed my remarks at the beginning that we are now at one of those pivotal moments in our nation's history is because any survey of human history will let you know that every totalitarian regime throughout human history, every authoritarian regime, every big welfare state regime from the Bolsheviks to the Chinese to an administration that is growing the state right here in America, there are two things that they do. They destroy or weaken the family because the family, within our experience, is the incubator of liberty. Two, they silence the church and those in the pews of the church. So in our discussion, it always comes up, particularly within the present framework of when you say the word resistance, when you say the, word of the, the two words of civil disobedience, they think of the criminal activity that we see on our TVs uh, at night and in responses in Baltimore or Ferguson or what have you. But the question is, how consistent is it with our Christian practice and belief, and how consistent is it with American tradition for citizens to resist bad decisions. Going back again to your uncle and his letter from a Birmingham jail, which is one of the most inspiring documents, I think, in American history. And for those who have not read it, now is the time to read it and to study it. Of course, he quoted the American founders, and they were geniuses and wonderful gift, speaking of self-evident truths and unalienable rights endowed by a creator. But he did more as a Christian leader. He positioned them within a 2,000-year history. Indeed, beyond the Christian church, all the way back to Sinai, he spoke of the natural moral law written on the human heart. He spoke of St. Augustine, of Thomas Aquinas, and he developed his, if you will, apologetic for defending his mission based on the natural moral law. See, one of the problems we're running into, and you, we all know this, is twofold. One, well, that's your religious position, mm -hmm. and therefore dismissing it. Mm -hmm. What we're saying about marriage and family is not simply a religious position. In fact, it goes before any religious tradition or any civil government. It's always been this way. It's cross-cultural, and it crosses over millennia. There's no question that revelation has elevated it and transformed it. I'm a, I'm a Catholic by choice. But what we're saying is that this is the natural moral law, and it's been written on the human heart, as Paul said in Romans 1. So our position is a natural moral law position, and as Dr. King teaches us, we need to begin discussing it that way. Secondly, we live in an age, and you referred to regimes, Ken, that, that silence the church. How do they do it? They turn every fundamental moral issue into a, quote, religious issue. Then they seek to banish the church or religious institutions to behind their front door and say, that's okay, you can talk about it at Sunday Mass or at your service or whatever, but don't take it into the public square. Well, we cannot and will not accept that because even though Christianity may be profoundly personal, it is not private. We have an obligation to share it. 
and to infuse the culture with the values informed by faith. Dr. King knew that. He worked with all men and women, whether they had a religious tradition or not. And he knew that it was fundamentally true that we have equal rights. We have human dignity. And the same is true with marriage and family. So yes, we need to protect the free exercise of religion and all of those conscience rights that are part of the American polity. But we need to start drawing beyond the founders, I believe, to the 2,000 year Western Christian tradition and beyond that and begin to frame our discussion and our political participation in the way Dr. King taught us. Read Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Read his beautiful um, Letter from St. Paul to America, to the American churches. I, I, it's in, there's a beautiful little compilation I've been carrying with me literally for decades. It's falling apart called Strength to Love, yeah. which is a compilation of his sermons and homilies. You see, people forget it was his Christian faith that inspired his heroism. And we need, in this day and age, men and women who are willing to heroically stand for what is good, what is true, and what is honorable. Wow. Part of something that I've done during my lifetime, I served as a legislator in Georgia uh, for two terms. And so I wrote laws and passed laws and some of the laws that impacted family, domestic violence, those types of things. And then I am a certified paralegal still today. I don't practice it, but I understand the law a little bit. I have three of my children are attorneys, and one of my children is in medical school. So thinking about the law and, and what Deacon just said and what you can have laid out, there is natural law, and that's God's law. That's right. And it's really based many uh, civilizations who have been successful base their laws on the Ten Commandments. And Jesus' love, the greatest being, Jesus' law, the greatest being love. Now common law is man law. Man's law is man-made law. So mercy overrides common law. God's mercy over, overrides common law or man's law. So men will attempt whether they have on, and women, whether they have on the robes and their justices and people look up to them, they're still human beings. So they're faulty and flawed. So we still can't worry about, we have to do something about, stand against, speak against. We actually might have to refuse to perform the, what they think will be marriage ceremonies. It's impossible to marry two men to each other or two women. It's just not possible. We have to refuse. The two cannot become one. It is biologically impossible, scientifically impossible, emotionally impossible, definitely spiritually impossible. You can actually hold a gun, heaven forbid, to a preacher's head and say, do this marriage. Now, he or she may say, okay, or they may say, I won't. But even if they speak the words, it's not possible. It is impossible. We have to be able to articulate that on all the levels we just said, spiritual, physical, science. The only way is by common law, legally, that's the only thing they could win. They can't even win on the other levels. They cannot. It's not possible. We need to understand that and know that, not fall into the false sympathies. I wanted uh, something my uncle said, and uh, Strength of Love is great too, because it is a compilation, and then there's a compilation of his prayers and various things, and I use those in King Rules a lot, in rediscovering lost values. He all, also did one, uh, Death of Evil on the Seashore, <laughs> and uh, talking about how the uh, apostles and when he went out to get the fishes of men and they left that life and all of that. In his sermon, Rediscovering Lost Values, Uncle Emil said, the first principle of values that we need to rediscover is this, that all reality hinges on moral foundations. In other words, that this is a moral universe and that there are moral laws of the universe just as abiding as the physical laws. But interestingly, in this argument, the moral and the physical both say it's impossible. And what he's saying, and, and this is why he was a natural law thinker, is that there's a moral foundation to freedom. Our freedom, our choices matter. Our choices not only change the world around us, 
They change us. And there are some things that can never be chosen because to choose them is wrong. Dr. King was unafraid to say that because all Christians have got to start saying that, not with a wagging finger, but with an open embrace. There's another way to live. Before they were called Christians at Antioch, they were called the way. And the way we are proclaiming, and the founders are a great example, they were not all Christians, but they were all moralists. They realized there's a moral foundation to freedom. So what we choose matters, not only as individuals, but as a nation. And we cannot choose against what is good and what is true. And that's what he's saying there. That's what he lived. And he showed heroism because he understood the interplay between just and unjust laws. And we are dealing with unjust laws. And he quoted Augustine as saying an unjust law is no law at all. And he quoted Aquinas that in fact, an unjust law cannot be obeyed. Now that's a challenge, I know, but that's the time we live in. You know, I, I, I say this in uh, evangelical circles where I'm speaking more and more these days as, as a Catholic clergyman. And I say, these may be difficult times, but these are our times. We were born and born again for these times. These are our times and the Lord never promised easy. And you know, I'm a non-denominational Christian who works for a Catholic organization. I know. <laughs> Father Frank. And right. so when you hear us both talk, you say, well, are you a Catholic? Are you an evangelical? <laughs> are you a non-denominational? Are you a Baptist? What are you? But I think these gentlemen and I are saying we're Christian. That's what we're saying, right? Well, and, and let me go back to um, if you want to exercise in the challenge of our time, and the, the forcing Dr. King's memory from what he stood for and the foundation he stood on is that you, if you go to the memorial here in Washington, D.C., and you look at, you search for the word God in that memorial. We have, in fact, built a memorial to a guy who was guided by God's word, and we don't mention on his memorial. And I spoke out about it before they opened it. I asked the question. We, we do not have the word God. No. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's part of a very evil secular strategy. Secular humanist. To cleanse God and faith from the public square. That's true. It is just, you know, and we must say, and, it, and, and it's part of a clash between moral absolutes, which Dr. King believed in, and relativism. You would have, they would have us believe that there are no moral absolutes. If it feels good, do it. Don't ask the question what is the right thing to do because there's no one right thing to do. You embrace that thinking, they've won. Dr. King understood you could not talk about respecting the human dignity of all if you did not believe in moral absolutes. Relativism is the tool of authoritarian, totalitarian governments and regimes and big welfare state governments and regimes. In order for government to take the place of God, they must cleanse God from the public square. Mm. That is how they create a dependency, not on the word and the guidance of God, but on the handouts of big government. You know, there's another thing, Tim. <clears throat> 
really important as Christians that we emphasize, and that is it'll never set you free. Only the truth will set you free. And the message we proclaim is a message of freedom and of happiness, of human flourishing. This is the message that has been proclaimed. Now, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and it has brought down totalitarianism over and over again. Why? Because in every human heart, there is a hunger to be free. And we're living in a great existential moment in the United States and in the whole West. And it's not time for us to worry or to, to draw up the drawbridge or to wag our fingers. It's time for us to boldly go into this culture and proclaim the path to freedom. That is what we need to do. When I was coming here today, I'm walking through D.C., and I drove four hours to get here, and I forgot about the fact that they're continually tearing up streets and then rebuilding streets in D.C. So I parked as close as I could, and I'm walking, and I'm approached by this emaciated young man, and I could just see the pain in his eyes, and he had a cup, and I could see he was on meth. I just knew it. Maybe he wasn't actively on it, but he was a man in great need. And I gave him what I had, and I said, now let's talk. There's another way. There's another way, a way to freedom, a way out of this slavery. And that way is God. And I held up my deacon's cross. And I said, now I'm going to give this to you, but I'm going to ask only one thing. Let me pray with you. And I prayed with him. Not because I'm some great pooba. I'm not. You know, I'm just a guy trying to get to heaven and live a life faithful to Christ. But because I cared about him. And I've raised five kids. I've got seven grandchildren. I thought of my own children. I thought, my goodness, this young man needs the Lord. It was an embracing moment in many respects. We need to do more of that, and we need to get ready for what's going to happen because, and again, I'm not an alarmist. I'm filled with hope. I'm a Christian. But we have been, we've faced the boot of the state many, many times. Fortunately, in the West, we aren't shedding our blood. But, you know, our brethren right now in the Middle East and North Africa are. So we're facing a soft persecution, but it's time to toughen up and get ready and ask the Lord to give us the grace that will be required to proclaim the message of freedom. Well, let me just uh, bring this portion of the program uh, to, a, to a stop by <clears throat> telling your story. My family had uh, wings. Uh, there was the Catholic wing, the Baptist wing, <laughs> the apostolic wing. And I, re I remember going with uh, a couple of um, my cousins who happened to be Catholic and, uh, and Baptist to uh, an apostolic uh, service. And <clears throat> the minister was preaching and he kept looking at his watch. And my cousin who was Catholic saying, I, I shouldn't even be here, but uh, can you at least tell me why does he keep, what does it mean that he keeps looking at his watch? And my cousin who was apostolic said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> I see you don't get it. <laughs> the Catholic was looking for ritual and yeah, I understand. No, no, he was, he was looking, he was, so we, we uh, the, the, uh, the Catholic wing of my family speaking, or we, we said that we would do this first one in 50 minutes and we would do it. Uh, and now if we let the uh, apostolic and Baptist wings uh, uh, sort of kick in, we can go to one, we can go to 1.30 if we want to. <laughs> so let's go, let's open it up for questions. Did he say apostolic? I, 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 all three of them together. I, 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 <laughs> all three words. Apostolic. <laughs> apostolic. Yeah. All of them okay, Will. Thank Sorry. you so much. My name is Marguerite Duane. I'm a family physician. I'm faculty at Georgetown, and mainly these days I'm a stay-at-home mom. Um, a few years ago, we had some neighbors that were friends of ours that had children our children's age that were going through a divorce. And this was a painful time. It was a painful time for my young children. And I did something that I thought was a simple way of reassuring my children of the commitment that my husband and I have. And I put a bumper sticker on the back of my car that says, one man, one woman for life. Simple, positive statement. Now, flash forward five years, that simple, positive statement has a very different meaning. 
And uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was on the phone with a friend of mine who said to me, do you realize how absolutely offensive and hateful your bumper sticker is? Do you know how many people you hurt every time you drive to pick up your kids from school? Because you're saying to them what they're doing, the way they live their life is a sin. And, and I said to her, you know, I, I explained the reasons why I put the bumper sticker on my car. And she's like, well, that doesn't matter. Why can't you just tell your kids that? Why don't you just take that bumper sticker down? And then I can explain to everybody for you. I'm like, what are you going to explain to everybody for me if I take this bumper sticker down? That I'm okay with same-sex marriage? Because whether or not I have that bumper sticker on doesn't change my view of marriage. But what she said what really like kind of drove the stake. She's like, you know, she's like, you may be fine with it on your car, but think about how it makes your children feel and how they're going to be hurt because of the way you feel. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but she's right. You know, it's one thing as a parent to be persecuted, as an adult to be persecuted. It's another thing as a parent to watch your children being persecuted. And in today's day and age, I think to myself, how do I raise a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, a three-year-old, a one-year-old, kids that, you know, are just beginning to understand. I mean, we do it by trying to teach them what God teaches us and, and by um, living, you know, according to Jesus's word. But it's very painful to me. And, and I mean, frankly, I came to this session today, one, because of that call, call a couple weeks ago, and I felt, okay, Lord, clearly I need to be strengthened in this battle because it is coming home right home to my face. And two, because I want to be able to prepare my children. And I, I, I think back to a comment that my mother made to me when I was in college at a fairly liberal Ivy League university, and I had a resident advisor who was gay, and I remember saying to my mom, what's the matter with that? And my mother was like, it's not what God teaches us. You know, she's like, it may seem fine, it's not fine. And it took me a long time to really appreciate those words but I want to be able to do so much more for my children to protect them, but also to empower them during this very difficult time. Let me speak as a mother and a grandmother first, and then a gentleman can weigh in uh, with so much more strength because we can't separate men and women in these discussions. You know, like some people will say to a man, well, you can't answer this because you're not a woman. You'll never have a child. You no, because we all are Christian. In the spirit, there's no male or female no bond or free only Christ all and also men and women can but I just want to go to the mama position real quick um, there are young people who are, and children even who are persecuted in school all the time and sometimes they'll get F's on a paper because they'll challenge the teacher and they ask the question their classmates will laugh at them so it's almost like the movie Terminator I don't know if you've ever seen it but uh, the mother has to prepare her son because the evil machines are coming and she takes her life training him to be a soldier. And everybody would have said, well, don't tell him that. Don't even tell him the machines are coming. Just pamper him, stay and keep him at home. But we're doing, if we really love our children, we are doing them a disservice of not teaching them the truth, teaching them how to defend it in love, not judgment, knowing when to speak and when not to speak, even to engage a teacher or not to engage a teacher at a certain time. And so, uh, Sometimes they'll have to write papers. All of my children have been persecuted in school, not accepted into certain schools. All kinds of things happen to them because they will not compromise those views. So you, if we really love our children, that's a false compassion to protect them, uh, keep them from people attacking them, because one day it's gonna happen and you might not be there to pamper them at that time. So real love can't pamper. The times are too serious. First of all, your children are very fortunate to have a mother who loves them like that. Yeah. Who cares so much that obviously even watching you, the tears in your eyes, that's love. And that's reflecting God's love to them. And that will last. Uh, next year I'll celebrate 20 years ordained as a deacon, 40 years married. Five children. And the things that last are exactly that kind of love. That's planting deep seeds in them. But I think we need to make some distinctions that are very, very important for us to understand. First of all, from history. You remember the early Christians were persecuted as enemies of the state. They were political charges, odium generis, and their failure to, to offer to Caesar 
we're moving into something of a parallel now, and we need to be ready for that, okay? We need to realize that when we say something like one man, one woman, see, homosexual and lesbian people have been with us for a long time. That's not the question. But never before in history, never before in history, have we said that anything other than one man and one woman can constitute a marriage. So this is new. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with developing some thick skin because by saying the truth, that doesn't mean we're not loving or that we don't have compassion or empathy for those with same-sex attraction. What we're saying is that marriage is what it is. And the most loving thing, I think Alveda is right, that you can do for your children is to give a witness of faithful marriage because, see, inside of them, they know what's true. This is what we mean by natural law. It's written on the human heart. Paul wrote about it in Romans 1 and Romans 2. And we all know what's true and right. You can say to you blue in the face that this is all going to be great. We're all going to be free and liberated. We're not. It's going to lead to disaster ultimately. So the most loving thing that you can do is what you're doing. Be a good mom, but also get ready because it's going to get harder and harder to share the truth. And it's never easy to hear somebody say, you're this, you're that, you don't care. You just have to stay closer to God and continue to proclaim what is the most loving thing? You can't change that. And thank you so much for being a good mom yeah, because ultimately absolutely. that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Back here and then here. Uh, James Rennick Manship. I'm a journalist for justice and a former president of um, a Christian newspaper, which we had a byword as the fortnightly fortress of faith. We had an leading article called Marriage or Mirage. And looking at the word use there, I believe it was Lenin who said, allow me to choose the words used in a debate and I'll predetermine the outcome. So in that, we need to be very careful as Christians to never use the word gay because that's a word that denotes a positive meaning. We should either say sodomite if we want to be biblical or say homosexual if we want to be neutral. But we essentially concede defeat when we use the word gay. Now, also, we shouldn't use the word marriage. And I'm just, this is the question. Let us always say this is a domestic partnership, a business agreement between two men and two women. It is not a marriage. I've been before, up in front of the Supreme Court dressed as George Washington, and I've had people come and say, well, what do you think about gay marriage? And I said, there's no such thing. First of all, it's not gay, and secondly, it's not marriage. And so in that, I ask you to comment about choosing the words we use in a debate so we don't lose it before we start. I, <clears throat> one, in terms of trying to tra train myself, uh, I, I talk about natural marriage. And if you talk about natural marriage, there's no way that you can use the same sex natural marriage. There's no same sex natural marriage. It, it, it is a matter of training. You're, 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 you're right. Uh, homosexual unions are not marriages. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is a matter of, it is a matter of discipline uh, and I'm not always disciplined, but I do take steps to sort of train my mind so that under battle, uh, I'm very comfortable uh, in talking about natural marriage uh, as opposed to traditional marriage. I, I talk about natural marriage because when you start there, then it, in fact, uh, eliminates the possibility that you can talk about same-sex marriage. Uh, there's a bigger issue, though, with words, and mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, words are so important, and we've made a lot of mistakes. I mean, C.S. Lewis spoke of verbicide, the murder of a word, huh? And in The Abolition of Man, he, he brought this up. And we, we really did make some mistakes. I think traditional marriage, I was writing this years ago, was a mistake. It's an adjective that unfortunately backed us into a corner because it immediately it opens up to us, oh, you want to go back. We don't. John Paul II put it this way in his wonderful uh, letter to families, the future of the world passes through the family. Marriage and family are the future, okay? 
But it also opens up this whose tradition. That's just your religious tradition. Marriage is what it is. But at the same time, we've made so many mistakes in language that I think going forward, we ought to also be careful. While I understand what you're trying to say with marriage and mirage, and you know, I'm a wordsmith, you know, lawyer, writer, that kind of stuff, I think we also have to show empathy. We do have to show empathy for people who have same-sex attraction. We don't want to buy the false equality and the false equivalency and have a cultural revolution over it all. At the same token, we want to be Christians and we want to show empathy. And there always have been people who struggle. That's why in various Christian traditions, like for example in my own tradition, you have courage, which is a great outreach, trying to help people who are same-sex attracted. The real issue here is not empathy for people who are same-sex attracted. We should have that. And if we're really empathetic, we should help them in any way we can. The real issue is the restructuring of the entire civil order, a literal cultural revolution, which will not help anyone, and most particularly our children, who have a right to a mother and a father. And I, I want to weigh in on that, too, because uh, before 83, before I was born again, man, I was down on the whole situation. And I agree, gay is just not proper because they're not gay, they're not happy. A lot of issues. You could hear Bruce Jenner's conversation, all that. So that's part of it. But uh, people would say, well, I was born this way. And so then we get into the argument, no, you weren't born that way. But actually, people could be born that way, but not created that way. So it's the semantics back again. We are created, all of us, in the image and likeness of God. Human beings are born into sin. Homosexuality is sin, just like uh, gluttony and all the, I really have a problem with the gluttony. I mean, I was, I'm like, my kids say, okay, you keep talking about all this other stuff, are you sure you're going to heaven? <laughs> I have lost weight, I have, I actually I have. That's great, I told you, I have dinner in a while. Because it collect, you know, I'm, I worship you, almighty God, and I go home and eat half of a cake. <laughs> and it wasn't working, so people can be born into sin. And Jesus clearly said in Matthew, uh, uh, in the book of Matthew, uh, he says some are born eunuchs, some are made eunuchs, some choose to be eunuchs. Well, in our Western understanding, we think eunuch just means castration. But there's a whole study that explains a lot of stuff. So one day, with that understanding, a lady who called herself a dyke, and she walks up to me very hate-filled and angry, well, I was born this way. I said, well, honey, there's no argument. Be born again. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I said that, <laughs> you could be born with anything, not created. We are created in the image and likeness of God. But to argue with who's born this way, who's born that way, what the problem is, that's counterproductive. And during my father's lifetime, A.D. King and my uncle, they had a word for homosexuals that was not pleasant. And as a little girl, I, would, I hated that word, and they would use that word. And I said, but that's so mean. So the compassion is, if you're born that way, be born again. If it's a problem with your flesh, that's one thing. If it's in your mind and you don't care, you know the word and you don't care because you're going to do what you want to do, that's a deeper problem. The flesh is easier to deal with because you could just say, I'm just not going to have sex. I'm going to be celibate. That'll take care of the flesh, but the heart is deeper. So that's why we have to say, hey, man, I have some issues too. Not that particular one. They, they got the person on the drug, same kind of thing. Well, I just can't get rid of it. Well, Jesus can help you get rid of it. So we, the words are important. But the human heart and the compassion that we address these issues with, that's going to be very important. Do a study in that some are born eunuchs, made eunuchs, choose to be. So study in the ancient languages what eunuch really means, and then just tell people to be born again. Hi, my name is Melissa Ortiz, and I first of all want to speak to this mom down here. I was persecuted as a child mercilessly be first because of my disability and because I was an outspoken Christian from the age of five. Um, couple that with a sister who became pregnant out of wedlock and who chose not to get an abortion and marry the baby's father and raise a family. I don't know how my mom did it, but she did it. She would look at me and she would say, come here, sit on my lap. Let's cry a minute. 
And then she would look at me and say, go wash your face. You are courage. And I would just encourage you to raise lion-hearted children who can stand up to it. Uh, which kind of springs me into my next thing. It's interesting. My husband and I have the awesome privilege of being the o- one of only three straight couples on our block in our neighborhood here in D.C. And these men and women who have chosen that lifestyle sit at our table and we have amazing discussions. Amazing. My husband's a Christian counselor and they all know that. They all know that we came to D.C. so that he could go to seminary. And it's interesting because love wins the day in the end. But I would love to hear the panel address, and and, um, let me, before I tell you what I want you to address, the language that we use absolutely matters because Jesus Christ died for people who were sinners. He died for people. And until we learn to talk about people who have same-sex attraction, people with disabilities, people who this, people who that, the other side is never going to care what we have to say. They don't care anyway, but until we learn to talk about individuals as as human beings and people and restore their human dignity, it does not matter what else comes out of our mouths. And so I would like to ask you this. Um, One of the things, I go to an Episcopal church, and it's it's on our doorstep but not in our hallway yet, the, the whole having to perform gay marriages and all of that. And... I would love to know your response to so many Christians who say, well, love is love, and if we love them, we have to go along with their choices. That is a slippery slope. And I can tell you that from a legal standpoint, it is, it is already being teed up. If, in fact, love is the determining factor of who should get married. Uh, polygamy is right around the corner. Be- because at the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if two women and one man said we're in love, and you've already said love is the determining factor, you in fact have opened the door to that. Uh, it is, it is it, you know, that that is something that they don't like to talk about in, in, in public discussions and debates on this issue. Uh, but, the, but the reality is, is that that's, that's not, you know, folks who are married should love one another. It is, it is, you know, it is nothing wrong with me in a non-marital way loving my neighbor, you know, in a, in a Christian way. All right, so love drives this. But and in fact, it has. It is not the determining factor as to who should be married. And love and sex are two different things, as Ken just said, because there are so many types. Philios, eros, uh, agape is the highest, absolutely. So there are so many types of love. But the purpose of marriage between one man and one woman is procreation. And that's where the sex belongs. And that's why even dating, my son told me the other day, uh, unfortunately, I was the first one in the King family legacy that I know of that got a divorce. And it was very catastrophic, it has been. And redefining marriage also redefines the family. And there are so many things that hurt, but sex and love are two different things. Because, don't raise your hand on this one, but how many of us know or even happened to us had sex and there was no love in it? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) You see, so love and sex are two different things. The purpose of that monogamous marriage between that one man and one woman, and that's the main problem with polygamy. Ask Solomon, my God. The man had all those wives and concubines, and he finally lost his mind. And he was powerful. He's one of the best examples in the whole Bible. Wonderful man. So, and and after Jesus came, then the more excellent way came. And that's when it really became possible for that man to rise above that, that state where he felt like he needed a lot of wives, where he could actually have that one wife. Go back like Adam and Eve was supposed to stay. And Jesus on that cross with his shed blood put it back where it can work. So love and sex are not the same thing. 
And that's what we have to teach people to. Let me, before Keith responds, let me just set the context for my personal situation. My uh, dad was so conservative that he prohibited it premarital sex because he thought it might lead to slow dancing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he did give his clear instruction on, on marriage, though. He went back to the first book of the Bible. It is not good for man to be alone. And he created them male and female. And that is the kind of love, and only kind of love, that can constitute marriage. And the sexual relationship within marriage, the conjugal embrace, is unitive and procreative. I don't want to get overly theological. It's for procreation. Say that again. Unitive and procreative, and the two can't be separated. And we need to once again recover the beauty and the dignity of human sexuality by proclaiming the Christian vision and the Christian mission for marriage. Now, on your comment on love, and Alvita mentioned this, it's tough in the Greek because you've got all these different kinds of forms of love. And, and we don't have that. We have the word love in English. So you have brother and sister love, huh? But they shouldn't get married, right? And you have all kinds of love. The love of marriage is that self-giving love, agape, but also even more. This is why Jesus marries the church. It's the complete gift of self. And this is what we proclaim in Christian theology happens in the marital embrace, the complete gift of self to the other in love, which is always open to life. So this, it's not only a slippery slope, but it fails to understand the uniqueness of marital love. So finally, I think you're right, we need to talk about human persons, and we need to once again recognize the dignity of all human persons, including uh, persons with same-sex attraction, but we cannot give up the truth about marital love. Our colleague in the back has a, a question, and then we have a question here in front. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Irina Grosu, uh, Director of the Center for Human Dignity here. Uh, my question is, I think where we are failing in our message is the other side is saying you Christians don't have a right to discriminate and so take, keep, keep your um, positions off of our decisions which is similar to other um, you know other positions but the point is is that how do we show that this is not like the civil rights movement here with um, Alveda King and uh, uh, c can we talk about how we deliver that message that this is not uh, about discrimination, but this is about um, presenting a beautiful message of what marriage is and what it cannot be. And can you can you speak to that? To the lawyer first. Uh, well, well uh, let me let, oh, let, let me let, let me uh, let, let, uh, at, at, at the at the end at the end of the day. Um, one, it, it is it, it is a transgression against natural law. But nobody has a right to destroy a God-inspired and defined institution. Absolutely. That, that nobody, and no court can give anybody the right to do that. Absolutely. Uh, and that's where we have to start. And, and, and that's, you know, so what we have to do is, and I think we, we try to be consistent. Yeah. So the, the attempt to redefine marriage is not the only challenge to the most existential, existential, but uh, adultery, you know, uh, uh, you know instant divorce. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of threats to this great institution mm -hmm. of, of, of marriage, mm -hmm. and we, we should be willing to speak to all of those threats and it is in speaking to those threats, and I think this is what you're getting, we, mm -hmm. we have to talk about how we celebrate the beauty yeah. of natural marriage. Yeah. First of all, I love the name of your center. It's the first I've heard of that. That's a wonderful name, the Center for Human Dignity. So you've already gotten off to a good start because you're putting the whole discussion where it belongs. What helps us to really fully be human? Because we're created in the image of God. And how can we grow in that image? Because when it comes down to it, and this may sound philosophical and theological, but I'm prone to that. This is really a struggle for freedom, the nature of human freedom. What are we choosing and who are we becoming uh, in the choice? Now, you said this isn't about discrimination. I have to tell you, it soon will be. 
Because when the state, whether it's through the judiciary or a referendum in Ireland or executive orders for anything and everything, everything that an executive determines, when the state makes such an action, it's enforced by the police power of the state. So we may very well be facing overt, not just covert, but overt discrimination. Uh, as a, in, in my own tradition, I witness weddings. And I do so, and I, I'm in Virginia, so I do so with civil authority and, and the authority of the church. And I cannot and will not witness something that cannot be a marriage because it cannot attain the ends of marriage. So I agree with you, we have to first put it in the premise of, of human dignity, that's the field it belongs in, and then we also have to live it in a vibrant and a hopeful and a wonderful way. Remember, this may be the first time that a culture has gotten this far off the trail to call anything but between one man and one woman intended for life open to life of marriage. It's not the first time Christians have gone into homosexualized cultures. We've been doing it for 2,000 years. Okay, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. And what have we done? We've lived another way with empathy toward those who are struggling with disordered appetites and, and affections. We've lived another way. You know, there's a professor, um, a sociology professor named Rodney Stark who's written several books. But I remember the first one I read back in the early 90s was called The Rise of Christianity. And he did a really interesting study of how the early church went from being a small band of followers of this Jewish rabbi to turning the world upside down. And he said they did it by their way of life. Because back then, for example, there were not only primitive forms of abortion, but infant exposure. You don't want the baby, you put him or her out on a rock for slave traders or for the birds of prey. Uh, and, and we have records, for example, in the Didache, 65 AD, uh, explaining that Christians, uh, we share our goods but not our wives. They lived a different way of life. And what happened, Professor Stark said? Men wanted to marry Christian wives. Why? Because they take care of their children. We need to live that alternative way again. I mentioned in my opening remarks, remember, it was at Antioch we were first called Christians. Before that, we were called the way. So we're going to need to live this way because ultimately this is the way that all men and women will find that freedom and that joy and grow in that human dignity reflective of the image of God. But two, discrimination is already here and we're going to have to stand against it and deal with it. Finally, we have got to be clear on this. It isn't just about protecting marriage, but society itself. Before civil society, the first society was the family and is the family. It's the first church, the first school, the first government, the first mediating association, the first economy, the first hospital. So we're really talking about a radical restructuring of society that will not serve the real common good. CNS News. Mm -hmm. um, just to expand on the children a little bit, because aside from parents talking to their children, there's a whole lot of things that could happen if the uh, Supreme Court decides in favor of same-sex marriage. The expansion of adoption of children of same-sex couples, the um, sex education in schools that are going to tell children that, you know, being even transgender is okay. Um, just in out in the public and the things that are available now that you see if you go to New York City, men holding hands and women together. Um, so I, I think if any of you can address children on a kind of a broader level of what we can do for children. Thank Penny, you. I don't, I don't want to go into great, thanks for the question, to great detail mm -hmm. about why I know this. But as I say, this issue is enmeshed into even our own families now. And little children are often confused because it's, I think it was Deacon, one of you referred in Romans, in the book of Romans chapter one, it says from the beginning, God puts it in our hearts that know what's right. So the little children are now saying that they're confused, they've done polls, and the little children want a biological male for a father and a biological female for a mother because that is wired and trying to make it in the curriculums, for example, in school, teaching it and all of that, the children are confused. And so it is not healthy, and there are many studies, there are probably more studies, studies that prove that it's not healthy for the children than there are that say that it's okay, but they, the media will promote the ones that say it's okay and won't let you see the ones that tell the truth. But I personally could really 
testify about children being harmed and very confused. So it is a problem. I'll let my colleagues help. Kat, did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, no, I, I, that's, that's, that's good. Okay. Cause I'm, I, after you weigh in, um, then we have two, our last two questions here. We okay? Preston Knoll, Tradition Family Property. Uh, I remember years ago in, when I lived in New York that uh, a good and holy bishop, uh, Bishop Austin Vaughn, used to go to Operation Rescues, and he would, he would barricade at the clinics, and he went to jail. And when in jail, he gave an interview, and the New York Post ran a screaming headline and said, a uh, jailed bishop to Cuomo, who was governor at the time, you're risking hell. And then there was a back and forth between Governor Cuomo and Bishop Vaughn. Bishop Vaughn was to be there for a few weeks. Guess what? He was out of there in a couple of days. He lost that back and forth in public opinion. And if this ruling that's coming down in the next few days is what we fear it will be, well, who will end up going to jail? I'm convinced of this. What do you see as the you know, the, the upshot of that. What do, you, what do you think is going to happen when people start actually going to jail because they, they will pray their rosaries in public or they won't be silent or they won't do same, you know, they won't uh, quote unquote marry people against the ruling of the, of the government. What do you, how do you see this playing out? Well, I, you know, I'll respond. Um, we've got a 2,000 year history of sometimes having to do just that, obeying God rather than men. And when it comes down to that, and again, Dr. King stood on the shoulders of giants in this, and it is coming to that. Uh, there will be in the Washington Post, hopefully this week, a full-page ad. We ask you not to force us to choose between the state and the laws of God, an open letter to the Supreme Court Justices of the United States. Uh, along with many others, I've been a part of this. We also have a defendmarriage.org site with thousands upon thousands are signing it, we may very well find that what you're talking about happens. Now, what happened with Bishop Vaughn brought about good fruit. No one wants to lose their freedom. But if, in fact, that is what we're asked to do, we may need to do it. And there are many people, Catholic, evangelical, Orthodox people who are prayerfully discerning this right now. Now, I know some people say, oh, civil disobedience. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, somebody sent me a thing saying, um, should conservatives practice civil disobedience? It's kind of like, this isn't a conservative liberal issue. This is an issue of what is true and what is good and what is right. And we may be asked to do that. And what happens when the church responds in that way? Ultimately, it's turned to good. You know, one of the promises of the Bible is that we will also face persecution and suffering. We don't see that one on the bookshelves, but we may be seeing that one in the days and the weeks and the months ahead. All right, we got one question, and, and if it's the wrong question, you might have to respond because I have a hard commitment to uh, Dr. King at 1.30. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Matt Floyd. I'm the pastor of Calvary Bible Church in Westminster, and... Uh, I have a comment here. We'll have a question. You know, a lot of people have talked about love, and people, you know, we're we're accused of hate mongering, and all of that. Where where do we get the definition of love? Well, it's from the Bible. You know, you have First Corinthians thirteen talks about love, but part of that list there it says uh, it's not puffed up, it vaunteth not itself, it thinketh no evil, it rejoices not in iniquity. I mean, we're told there, right there, and then you have in Romans chapter. 12, uh, where it says that let love be without dissimulation. Let it be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. The first thing we're commanded to do after let your love be without hypocrisy is to abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. If um, in your experience, you know, and able to, uh, you know, I don't have the, maybe the, the public uh, opportunities that you have. I mean, I preach in my church, and when I say I preach in, in my church, my church is not a building. My church is to the people, and I expect them to go out and live what they were taught when they when they leave. But when when they go, do go out, and I've tried to live this by example, 
uh, when they had the, the Supreme Court had the hearings down there. I was able to stand in front of the Supreme Court, and I didn't stand with a bullhorn like some you know will do and say, you know, repent and those kind of things. Now, I teach that but one-on-one. I was able to talk to many people, and they would ask me, you know, with homosexuals, they would ask me, why do you care? Why don't you leave us alone? We'll leave you alone, which they won't leave us alone. But uh, I, I, so I would say, if as a Christian, I have a more responsibility to care about you than anybody else. Your lifestyle is destructive. It will destroy you. And so as a Christian, I love you, and I need to tell you. My kid might say, well, I love to drink this out of this bottle that has skull and crossbones. Or I would love to crawl across the street. Or I would love to, I don't care. You know, I'm not going to let you do that because you're destroying yourself. So in your experience, is it the, uh, the public speaking out or one-on-one with people that does the most effective or is a mixture of both? Um, go ahead. Mixture of both, and it goes right to those, those four arenas that I talked about at the beginning. Sometimes it takes direct action. Sometimes it takes legislative action. Sometimes it takes legal action in the courts. But one uh, arena is person-to-person, heart-to-heart, and, and we cannot put that on the back fence. We, we have to engage, we have to, we have to witness. And Dr. King said in a speech in 1961 that we are all heirs to the legacy of dignity. Uh, and, and that's what we have in our behavior and in our speech. We have to in fact project that we expect and respect, we ex- respect the human dignity of all. You start on that basis, you have more of a chance to win. Look, because we did promise that we would get out of here at 130, I'm going to ask uh, Deacon Fortier if he will, in fact, will close us in prayer and we can engage one-on-one. I know Dr. King has to go. Okay. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had together. We thank you most of all for the love that you have for us. So much love that you gave your only son, that we might be set free. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us to love in that way, with fullness, giving ourselves completely in him for others. We pray for this nation. Lord, you know the needs of this nation. We've lost our way. We've turned away from you. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on this nation that we may come back once again to who you are and become who we are called to be. We pray that the seeds that were planted here today would take deep root. Lord, for your church, bring us together. Across the divides that separate us, bring us together in this mission and this message of love. Father, we ask you in this new missionary age to give us the courage we will need to stand up for the truth, the truth that will set all men and women free. We give you glory, we give you thanks, and we pray your blessing upon us and upon all who are listening that we might in fact respond to your invitation with love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.